I need chat. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. And it sounds like I need new batteries. So anyway, welcome to chapel. Um, yeah, it's uh, this this semester has gone by so fast, uh, and we have heard so much and done so much, um, and it is good, and it is really good. Thank you, thank you. Um, today, uh, we're going to hear from uh, a friend of mine, um, be a friend of yours shortly, Gretchen uh, Ronovic. Uh, we graduated together, and this is pretty awesome, and it'll be 20 years in May. Isn't that amazing? It was 20 years ago. It's crazy. Uh, and so I'm really excited uh, to have her in the house. Um, she is uh, a mother of many, uh, a homeschooler, a uh, farmer's wife, uh, a teacher, um, a blogger. Uh, she'll probably mention some other things. Uh, just a multi, uh, multi-talented, very gifted uh, individual that God is using for for great things. Um, at the end of chapel today, I have, I believe, three, uh, three announcements. So when we're done, uh, we're not quite done. So sit tight, and we'll, and we'll uh, talk through a couple things. Before we bring up Gretchen, let's pray and ask the Lord to, to be in this with us today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for this, this gift that you give to us, um, this opportunity that you give to us to be, uh, to be together uh, to hear the word, uh, your word together, to be encouraged, uh, to be uh, exhorted um, uh, into further into your presence, uh, back onto the path as we've heard many times uh, this semester. Um, and we just thank you so much for Gretchen and for her willingness to come and be a part of chapel today. Um, may her words... Um, uh, may, may her words be your words, ultimately. Um, right now, we just pray for hearts that are prepared to hear from you. We pray for minds that are prepared to hear from you. Um, we pray for distractions around us, um, in our heads, that they, would be, uh, that they would be removed so that we could hear uh, from you. We pray all this in your mighty and your precious name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the stage, Gretchen Ronovic. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, my goodness. It is, um, it is so much fun to be here. Um, Hillcrest has an awful lot of memories for me. Um, I met my husband here. His name is Knut. I was, supposed to, I was told to look out for him when... Um, when I came my senior year, take a look at, for Knut because he's a friend of mine. He's coming for a senior year. And there was actually three Knuts from Norway that year. So there ended up being four Knuts, and I had to kind of hunt him down. But we have six kids now. Um, I graduated with Ryan and many others. We actually had a really crazy class. Um, there was a lot of craziness. The main um, principal, who had been here for decades and decades and decades, had just retired. And so they were totally reworking the student workbook and or handbook with all the rules and dress codes. And I think about that time and how it was a very transitional time for the school. And um, so many people were getting in trouble in our class. We were like the worst class probably ever to graduate from Hillcrest. He's laughing because it's true. And um, so many people in our class are like, missionaries and pastors and working in churches and at Hillcrest. And so it's just, it's fun to be here. There's, it's changed so much. We're going to be talking about knowledge today. Let's see, am I, get my, sorry. I was showing this to my daughter before class, so I got to back up. All right, we're here to talk about knowledge. Um, I think that's one question every student ever asks, why do I have to know this? Um, I know as I teach my kids, that's a question I hear every day. Why do I have to know this? Why is this important? Um, why do I have to know ca calculus? Why do I have to learn Latin? Why do I have to read this book? This isn't going to do me any good. I don't plan on getting into this with my career. And this is something that we think about often. And this is actually a very modern question. It's not a question that they asked 
very much back in ancient times. It used to be that they would ask different questions with, about education, but now they, they talk about, why do I need to know this? And I know that I've been hearing rumors that Hillcrest has been slowly transitioning to like more of a classical model. You might be hearing that um, word thrown around a little bit. And I think in many ways, it's just putting a correct label on what Hillcrest has been all along and just kind of more clearly defining that. Way back in ancient times, according to Aristotle and Cicero and some of the great thinkers of humanity, they had what was called the classical trivium. And I am obsessed with the trivium. I have been reading about it like crazy. Um, so the first stage of education is the grammar stage. That's like my little kids. That's like down to my two-year-old who repeats every single word that I say. And um, they watch TV and they memorize every single song they hear on TV and they sing it all the time. That is just the grammar. I'm getting the vocabulary. I'm learning the language. I am getting all this information and just facts. And then when you get into like middle school age, you're getting into the logic and dialectic age. And at that age, you're kind of putting all those facts together. This is connected to this and this is connected to this and, and um, which facts are true and why are they true. And then when you get to the high school age, you're in the rhetoric stage. And at that age, you're not just processing the information. You are creating arguments. You are creating, you're persuading people. You're using that information for a purpose. So to look, kind of going across the board, the grammar stage is when you're remembering some of our culture's um, greatest facts, greatest truths. In logic, you are thinking. And in rhetoric, you're speaking. In the grammar stage, you are learning what is true. In the logic stage, you're saying which, which truths are good and which truths are evil. And in the rhetoric stage, you're studying what is beautiful. In the grammar stage, kind of like your faith. It's when it's some, knowledge is something that's given to you. In the logic stage, you receive it. It becomes yours. You own it. And in the rhetoric stage, you're sharing that knowledge with others. And the reason why... Um, in ancient times, when the early church um, started to really get, um, get some momentum, right around that time, this Greek model moved over to the Roman Empire, and classical education was something that was a really big deal. And all the great thinkers said, our brains are made in a, in a triune way. We think in a triune way. Like when I, when, when I learn something new, even though I am at the rhetoric age, if I'm learning something new, you always have to start at the grammar stage. When I went to school here, I met a guy named Doug Rognes. He is a pastor now out in Moorhead. But I asked him what a combine was. See, I'm a farmer's wife now, but I didn't know what a combine was. And he, his family sold combines. And he would say, um, he's like, well, it has a header on it. And I'm like, well, what's a header? And he's like, well, it brings the grain into the hopper. And I'm like, well, what's a hopper? And he says, well, and then from the hopper, it goes in an auger over the grain cart. I'm like, what's an auger? I had no vocabulary for what he was talking about. He was trying to explain to me what a combine was, and I had no idea. You always have to start with the grammar. You have to start learning the vocabulary, knowing what you're talking about before you can actually do anything with it. But the early church was listening to all the great philosophers, and they said, of course we have a triune brain because we're made in the image of a triune God. And they said the grammar stage represents, in our design, God the Father, who was, who is, who is to come. The logic stage is God the Son, who connects things. He's connected worlds. He has put things together. And the rhetoric stage is the Holy Spirit, who just moves and affects and influences entire cultures. So this is kind of the way that we thought about knowledge for almost 2,000 years. It was actually in the early 1900s when this started to change. When we didn't look at knowledge as something that you, you learn, you receive, and then you, you put out, it became really different. And um, started kind of around the, the Industrial Revolution when um, things started moving from farms and getting the jobs just really changed. But first, education became really me-centered. What do I need to know? What's important to me? And 
it needed to stream, they needed to streamline the workforce. In the early 1900s, the assembly line was invented. Factory own owners realized that we didn't need to train someone to build a car. We could just train someone to build a part of a car over and over and over again. And the problem was that factory workers actually enjoyed thinking. They loved to debate current events. They were striking when they were not treated fairly. They enjoyed listening to classical music and reading great books. There was actually many factories that would have a designated reader who would read great classical books to the entire, they would have just shout out the Iliad or the Odyssey over the workforce because they were actually great thinkers. They were, family, they were from families of farmers and small business owners who have to know how to do so many things. I know, my husband's a farmer and his job is different every single day and he has to know how to do things every single day. He needs, needs to know how to do lots of different things. So education really changed during this tycoon era, in the era of Rockefeller and Carnegie. Rockefeller in particular decided to put a dollar figure on what information was important and what wasn't. He started a foundation called the General Education Board which poured millions and millions of dollars into public education because he was kind of frustrated that his workers didn't know how to follow orders. And so this was the mission statement for the Rockefeller General Education Board. In our dream, we have limitless resources and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conven conventions fade from our minds and unhampered by tradition, we work our own good will upon a grateful and responsive rural, rural folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryos, great artists, embryo great artists, painters, musicians, nor shall we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, statements, of whom we have ample supply. Basically, we just need people to do their job. And when asked to clarify, Rockefeller said, I don't want a nation of thinkers, I want a nation of workers. And things changed in education. When all of a sudden it got to be about a job, it wasn't about being a well-rounded human being. It got to be, how can we make money? Let me find my spot here. Getting back to our devotional, getting back to God, Let's, um, let's look at what the church says about how God reveals himself to us. Um, there's two, two basic ways, general revelation. It's basically our world. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. And then there's special revelation, which is scripture. All scripture is God-breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in right righteousness. God has revealed himself to us. So if God has revealed himself to us through creation, how important is it? In, our, in my homeschool community, um, we go to a group called Classical Conversations, and they have a motto there, which I absolutely love. Um, the purpose of education is to know God and to make him known. And I think that about sums it up. And I get it, I understand, you guys are all gonna need jobs someday. You're all gonna need to be trained. And I understand, I mean, being the mother of six kids, money is very important. Getting them fed, getting them everything they need is important. But we have to ask ourselves, are we, are we using our education to seek after money and success and having God be a footnote? Or are we seeking after God and trusting him with a provision for our life, whatever he decides that might be? So what is the purpose of knowledge? Simply put, it's worship. For instance, how do language and physics intersect? How does that lead to God? One of my favorite verses when talking about language John 1, 1 through 5, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
in whom was life, and the light, life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. One of my favorite authors and my kids' favorite authors is a man named N.D. Wilson, and he's written these like um, thriller books for kids. And then for adults, he's written some Christian literature. He's actually a classical English professor over in Idaho in, in a college. And he asked the questions, um, is what, what is the world made out of? It's kind of the questions all scientists ask. What is it made out of? Sci um, they used to say, um, we are made out of cells. And then they found out that there's actually stuff inside of cells. So then they said, all right, we are made, um, what are the stuff inside of cells made out of? It's made out of molecules. And then they started asking, what are molecules made out of? And they decided, all right, they're made out of atoms. And then more recently, scientists started asking, what are atoms made out of? And physics now has a string theory where atoms are made out of quarks. They're mostly space. And that's a real word, is quarks. Um, it's mostly made out of space, but there's little strings in there called quarks. And the problem that microbiologists have as they're studying is the problem of data. Evolution doesn't seem to account for the data that is programmed into a cell. And there are so many questions unanswered when you dig deeper of what the stuff is made out of. They get like pages and pages and pages of all this data. And even um, famous scientist and atheist Richard, Richard Dawkins acknowledged that the data that makes up a cell had to have been implanted into our world by some sort of alien life form. There's just, there's, there's no way to fully account for it. So where did the, where does our world come from? Where are those words, where that information come from? Why, what makes a quark stand up and do what it needs to do? God spoke. Andy Wilson says that when God spoke, it wasn't that the goo of the universe was sculpted into what it needed to be. God spoke and his words were, and I'll quote, so potent, spoken by one so potent, that they have weight and mass and flavor. They are real. They have taken on flesh and dwelt among us, unquote. He claims that when God said, let there be light, the, word, the words did not demand the light, the words actually became the light. If you want to know if God is still speaking, ask yourself if there is still light. His words from creation still hang in the air. Being present to a sunset, or staring into a microscope, or hearing a beautiful piece of music, or seeing the order of things leads us to worship. We have posted in my house, my kids are probably sick of it, but um, I, Albert Einstein had three rules of work. When he was trying to find out what the universe was made of, approach his work, how do I figure this all out? He had three rules for himself as he started about his day. Out of clutter, find simplicity. From discord, find harmony. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. You see, our brains were designed to name things and to order them. It's part of the job God gave us. And I think that you probably know what I'm talking about. Our, hate, our brains hate discord. It's like nails on a chalkboard. We all hate it. Um, when the choir or the band is flat or out of tune, we all cringe. When we are staring at a math problem that looks cluttered in disarray, we pull our hair out and our brains are trying to make sense of it. Because our brain is looking for harmony. It finds rest in harmony. If you've ever learned a new concept, and when you finally get it, when you're just like really, really struggling, and you finally get that concept, and you're like, yes, I got it. Thank goodness this is done. That's actually worship. When your brain reaches that point of understanding, that's a point of worship. It rejoices because your brain brought something that was confusing and understood it. Something in the brain was clashing, and it brought harmony. That's the, respo the response of that is worship. God is good, and he makes sense. It's easy to look at the clutter and the discord of the world and say that God is not here, but the words, let there be light, still hang in the air. We have not always 
arrived at the point of harmony yet. Do you know what else brings me to worship? Like, this is one example of, I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. Have you ever heard of the golden ratio? It's a mathematical equation. It kind of looks like this. So this is the golden ratio. You'll, you'll find it in math. You actually will find it a lot in science. If you study any design or art or graphic design, these proportions are actually scientifically proven to be the most pleasing to the eye. So if you study any design, you they'll do everything in the proportions of the golden ratio. And scientists have kind of nicknamed it God's fingerprint because you find it everywhere. Um, you find it in the spirals of the stars. You find it in the sea. Um, you find it in the way that flowers are made up of. You e even find that in every single species of tree splits at the rate of the golden ratio when it goes up into the branches, it's actually pretty phenomenal. And have you ever read the Bible and gone through the pages and pages of genealogy and thought, why do I need, why do I need to know this? Let's get to the good part. Notice that me-centered approach. You know, I just want to know this stuff that's going to affect me. And do you ever read about God um, giving instructions to build a the tabernacle or the temple or the Ark of the Covenant? And he says... I want you to make it this many cubits long and this many cubits high and this many cubits wide. And you're reading this and you're like, why do I need to know this? Did you know that every single proportion that God gives in the Bible as far as member, um, measurement is in the proportion of the golden ratio? Every single thing. It all follows the whole, every rectangle, every shape will always follow the golden ratio. It's almost like God was saying, I'm going to design this this belongs to me. This is me coming to you. Doesn't that just bring you to worship? God, how'd you do that? I have no idea. If studying a molecule leads to worship and studying math leads to worship and studying words and their meanings and their placement and their power leads to worship, then what is Satan to do? When you look at it that from that point, we are surrounded by a world proclaiming God. How does Satan at attack that knowledge? There's a couple ways I have noticed. The first thing that he does to attack knowledge is redirecting its purpose. Um, we say the purpose of knowing something is for money or power or success. Jim Carrey had a quote. I don't have it written down, but it's something like, I wish everyone had a chance to be rich and famous so they knew how miserable it was. Redefining its purpose. It's not for the purpose of worship. It's the, for the pur purpose of all the things that, that we want in life. Redefining our vocabulary. Words are changing a lot. My major was in English. I am obsessed with words. I'm, I'm obsessed with their power and their, um, the way that they can be turned so many different ways. There was actually a kid I heard, I don't even remember where I was, it was in some public place, and there was a, a group of guys, like in a mall or something, and there was a guy using the F word, it must have been five or six times in every sentence he said. He, it was almost artful, it was like almost beautiful, where like he was using the F word as a subject and as a verb and as a direct object and as an indirect object and as like a gerund and as named the part of speech, and he knew how to form the F word there. And I was just like listening, and I was like, I wonder if I could write a poem using just one word like that. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. I was just, I was really taken by it. And then I got kind of sad, because here was this young man who obviously had skill, he had a way with words that he just needed one and he could make some very powerful statements. Um, imagine what he could have done if he actually had vocabulary. I mean, imagine. He, this, this kid was made in the image of God. He had such a way and he had no vocabulary to use. He didn't know that there are more words that had even more power than that. The last thing is he was attacking, Satan attacks curiosity or encourages apathy. That's just kind of like, I don't know. It's this 
Apathy, when I think of what apathy is, I think of the most annoying sound in my house that my kids could make, which is, uh. I hate that sound. Just, uh. Um, God wants us to be curious. He loves when our brains are turned on. He loves when we're just digging deep and we're just wondering what things are. Satan is fighting a losing battle against knowledge. Recognizing his tactics is often the best step in fighting his, his methods. Ephesians 2, verses 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we, may, that we should walk in them. I love that verse. I recently learned that the word workmanship in that verse, um, the Greek word for that is poema. And that's actually, if you re- you might recognize it because that is our word for poem. We are God's poem. When he spoke the world into being and that those words were so powerful that they still hang in the air so many years later, that they still surround us, And when he made us, we are his poem to the world. Um, That knowledge isn't just for our use, it's for his use. God gave us this world as a gift to reveal himself to us. He gave his word, his son, as a gift. And may we never take that grace lightly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each and every student here today, Lord. I pray you would give them a a crazy curiosity. I pray that they would question everything. I pray that um, they would push the boundaries of what language can do. I pray you would fill their minds with what is good and true and beautiful. I pray that they would use their knowledge for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of knowing you better, for the sake of encouraging others, and for being a force in this world that you have designed them to be. In your name, amen. Thank you, Gretchen. So good. I, I too, I just uh, think about one of those last points that she made about apathy. Um, for me, I think that's one of the scariest things um, when, I, when I consider my own heart, when I consider my own posture towards learning, um, but also for you, that Satan would love nothing more than to just, whatever, doesn't matter. Why am I here? I'm just going to coast through. Um, and so many other thoughts beyond that. But I just, I, especially now, especially well, especially ever, but as we think about closing out these next three weeks, go hard. Like, finish, finish, this, finish this year well. Um, pursue knowledge and consider it. Uh, consider it worship onto your creator. That's good.